Over the years, we've seen hundreds of Smiths give it their all in our forge. Yes! There you go! The judges have critiqued a lot of blades, given advice, and oftentimes made a lot of tough decisions. This is the closest decision I have ever had to make. But now, for the first time ever, our judges are going to be the architects of this competition. This is the judges takeover. Over the next four weeks, they will be choosing every aspect of the competition, the weapons, the challenges, and all of the tests. With the judges at the helm, the Smiths are going to be challenged like never before, with each of our judges bringing their own unique twist to the competition. It's time for the judges takeover to begin. I'm Dale Brannigan from Shelby, North Carolina. I design technology systems for banks and financial institutions. I like forging for the escape, you get to hit things with hammers, and play with fire. <laughs> My name's Wesley Crumb. My full-time job is a wildland firefighter for the state of Mississippi. Being a firefighter, sometimes you gotta make a split-second decision going one way or the other, so I think it's prepared me for this competition. I'm John Blankman from Avon, Utah. I'm a fire sprinkler contractor. I love bladesmithing because at this point in my life, I'm stuck behind a desk most of the time, and this allows me to get back out and do things with my hands, and it's just fulfilling. My name is Tyler Gruntrod. I'm from Ordway, Colorado. The way I got into bladesmithing was actually forged in fire. When I saw the competition, it kind of gave me a push to give it a try, and the knife that I finished ended up looking a little more like a knife than I expected. So I made another, and then another, and then another, and here I am. Bladesmiths, welcome to the Forge. You're all here because you are talented bladesmiths. But what we want to find out is, do you have what it takes to compete for $10,000 in the title of Forge and Fire Champion? We've got three intense rounds of bladesmithing competition lined up for you. At the end of each one, you're going to present your work to our panel of expert judges, who will then make a critique and an elimination. Those judges are ABS Master Smith Jay Nielsen, Historic Weapons Recreation Specialist Dave Baker, and Edge Weapon Specialist Doug Markaida. Now you four are lucky enough to take part in a series of challenges we're calling the Judges Takeover. Now in each one of these competitions, our judges have decided the weapons, the tests, and the challenges that you'll be going through. I'm feeling a little freaked out right now. Worried about what's coming and uh, which judge it's going to be. Tonight, it's Jay's turn to take over. He's just got that crazy look on his face. If you look up insanity in the dictionary, you're going to see a picture of Jay Nielsen rubbing his hands with a crazy smile on his face. It's very frightening. Welcome to my competition. I guarantee you, this is not going to be easy. First of all, you guys see you got a cloth on your anvil. If you haven't watched my DVDs, you're gonna wish you did. Go ahead and pull that cloth. Your challenge today, gentlemen, is to make a blade using one of my favorite techniques, canister Damascus. But I don't want you to make just any blade. I want you to recreate a unique blade that I made. This gentleman is what I call a serpentine push dagger. The idea for this design actually came from this competition. I decided I want to challenge myself. Now, you're going to recreate my serpentine push dagger, but you have to stay within these following parameters. Your dagger blade must be between 8 and 9 inches, but your blade also has to have a recurve. You need to be set up for a full tang design, and you must remove your canister. Not gonna make it that easy on you guys. And that two and a half inch recurve is a big recurve on a nine inch knife. All right, guys, good luck. That's gonna be a challenge. Now in round two of this competition, you will add handles to your blades, turning them into fully functioning weapons, at which point our judges will check for strength and durability in a sheet metal punch and a metal chain slash. And then we're gonna check for edge retention in a canvas stab and slice. You have three hours on the clock. Good luck, gentlemen. Make Jay proud. Your time starts now. Boy, oh boy, this is brutal. I have watched Jay Nielsen's DVDs on how to make canister multiple, multiple times. My wife is sick of seeing them. <laughs> First thing I'm going to do is get white out in that can and let it dry. 
This is where preparation is really important. Yeah, and you really have to follow the steps, just like a recipe, to get that white out dried out. Because if you don't, then those ball bearings are going to have white out on it. And then they're not going to weld together. And then a can can fuse to the billet. It's going to be hard for me to concentrate knowing that Jay Nielsen is going to be staring there. And I'm just going to feel it in the back of my head. I think that's going to help me, though, be like, hey, better bring the egg in here. Why do you want to see the can fall? But having this double-edged dagger, it's not super wide, so I'd want the can off completely so it won't be right on the edge or anything. Well, I have my steel in the forge. I give it a little extra soak time. I go over and I measure the serpentine dagger. You can leave that canister in there for quite a while, and I wouldn't take it out until I saw the outside of the can starting to melt like a stick of butter. My favorite thing about Jay Nielsen is his complete lack of mercy. All four of the Smiths have grabbed their canisters, filled them with ball bearings, and sometimes to save time, they leave the can on. Well, we weren't doing that this time. You are evil. I think Jay Nielsen is just the guy that likes a challenge, and he likes to see other people challenge, too. <laughs> Whoa, Tyler's got a big burn hole coming through his canister there. I see that I have a hole in one of my welds, so my whiteout is leaking and causing a little fire. I need to weld that back up. Well, I'm a little worried that I might have burnt out all my whiteout because it possibly could stick to the can. So I can't peel something that's welded on. I hope it's good. This moment is crucial. Setting the welds is the most important part because if you give it too much pressure or not enough pressure, you're starting over. Wesley on the press. There it goes. Wesley's cooking. First weld set, I feel good. Hopefully, I can peel this can right off. It's not moving. It's welded solid. So I don't know if I didn't use enough white out or if I didn't let it dry enough or what. But I can't spend out any more time on this. I decided that I'm just going to leave it on, forge it out, and then grind it away. Grinding a can off is very time consuming. Wesley goes through all this, etches it, and you can see patches of canister on there. It's not bode well for Wesley's chances. My can looks nice like hot, melty butter. Now it's time to set my first weld. Dale's gone for his first press, and he looked like he was pretty hot, and he didn't bite down too hard on that first pressing, which is great. Almost there. John just did his first pass on the press, and it looked like he was nice, easy touches. But that billet was not that screaming hot. As we've seen, not having enough heat in the billet, you might find that the core of that billet isn't welded properly. It seemed to be moving well. I'm going to try to peel a can off. Nope. It was not welded yet. Uh-oh. John didn't oh. like what he saw in there. Uh-oh. Too soon. So I go back to the welder, seal it back up again, and go back in the fire. One problem with that is the whiteout's already cooked. So now it's probably going to weld to the billet inside. Mike Smith, you have two hours remaining. I'm trying to peel my can by grinding off the corner, but the problem is I don't see a seam anywhere. So that tells me that my billet is welded to the can. I think my whiteout ended up burning out through a little bit of holes I had, so it didn't stop it from sticking like it should. So I'm going to have to grind it off instead of peeling. Tyler and Wesley, I'm really worried about the amount of grinding they have in front of them. I'm pretty far behind, so. I got to pick it up. All right, looks like Dale has a clean billet, got the can ground off. It is shiny all the way across. I'm going to start to use the press to stretch out the billet lengthwise and to isolate the handle. This would be the ideal time for Dale to go over one, isolate that small section at the back, and then go and fuller it out. You really need a T-shaped blade. Yep. Oh, I think that's what he's doing. When I make normal knives, the tang goes in line with the knife. This is perpendicular, so I have to stretch this thing out sideways, which is not something that I do on a regular basis. Well, I get it out and pressed again. Try this again. Again, I don't know if it was hot enough to, to get it to weld. Here we go. We'll see. What in the hell? I can't peel a can off. The canister actually pinched on the hardened steel inside. 
John's tired. Oh, he's yeah. Beat, he's beat red. Oh, hell. I don't even know if I can save this billet. If I can't peel that can off, I'm going to be the first one to go home. I guess I got to start over. Hour and 20 minutes in, and John is starting over. John's biggest thing he needs to do is get that can together and leave it in there to get hot enough. The pressure has doubled, but I don't quit. Blaine Smith, you're halfway through round one. You have 90 minutes remaining. I got to fix them back cut about half of my billet off. I've got to start forwarding the shape. The shape of this blade is very difficult. Not only do you have four bevels to deal with, but you also have the extreme curve to deal with, too. And that just makes it insanely hard. We're going to bend it some more. I mean, who would have thought this would be a hard challenge? Gosh, Jay, you came up with it. <laughs> if you don't challenge the Smiths, they won't improve. Well, Tyler's aggressively hammering on that horn, trying to get that, that deep two and a half inch curve in there. Tyler doing a good job. He just got so much material. Dale's is looking pretty good. I am feeling exhausted, but uh, it's looking really cool. It kind of looks like a python. <laughs> I have everything nice and straight. I gotta start getting ready for my quench, do a couple of quick heat cycles, hopefully refine whatever horrible grain I created. It's definitely hard, that's good. I gotta grind. Bladesmiths, you are down to one hour. On the second billet, I'm feeling a lot better about the heat, so I should be good with the forge welding. John did fortunately at least let that billet get hotter. That color was a lot better the second time oh, around. Oh, yeah, it was. No, I don't have any time left to do any more. So I start peeling the can off. Well, let's hope John has better results this time. Go, John! There we, there go. we go, John. The bill is good. Now I have to go to town moving metal. Blade Smith, you have 30 minutes remaining. I pull my blade out of the quench, and it does not look like it really warped any. So it looks OK. And now I'm going to try to bring it to the grinder and try to grind off as much of this can that I can. And Wesley, I'm really worried about because it's less than 25 minutes. He's got to shape, grind all that canister off, and quench. He's kind of missing that recurve shape that you have. Pull it out. I see there's a little warp, but I don't have time to mess with it. I've got to get to the grinder. Maybe I can grind it out. I'm just running out of time. Blade Smith, you have 10 minutes remaining. My shape on this thing is really rough, but I just have to pull the plug on making it look pretty and get it in there to get it quenched. John has done a fabulous job of coming back from absolute disaster. This round is over. Huh. That was a lot harder than I expected. I am extremely happy with what I was able to do in an hour and a half. I didn't think that I was going to be able to do it, but I knew I wasn't going to quit trying. All right, gentlemen, the first three hours of this competition, we ask you to make canister Damascus and recreate Jay's serpentine push dagger. Not an easy challenge, but you all came through, so congratulations. But the time has come for the first critique and elimination. Dale, you're up. Please present your work. All right, Dale. By far, you have the closest design over here to what Jay has. Good job on that. But the problem with your blade is you got the tip really thin at the end, and that could be a problem in testing. If you move forward, it's about refining your blade and making it functional so that it operates without any issues at all. Good job. All right, Wesley, you're up next. Please present your work. All right, Wesley, first off, your steel looks pretty good, but we do have a couple issues. We definitely need more mass on the handle to make it comfortable and match that. You could always add material and stuff like that. My big thing is even if you add the material, the point is supposed to be lined up with the index finger and you could tell it's not. Doing a thrust 
with this, I'd have to move my arm and kind of hook into it to stab with it. You just need to find a way to make this look closer to that. John, you're up next. Please present your work. John, first off, man, you worked hard to make this. I commend you on that. Uh, you don't have that forward point, but there's enough mass in this blade that I can almost trace that blade onto this blank, which is a plus. For the most part, you've got a solid piece of steel. It's good work. Thank you. Tyler, please present your work. All right, Tyler, there, there's a lot of steel still here. But on the plus side, you got the shape pretty close. You do have that forward face and tip, but you definitely need to do something down here to add some more to the tang. If you move into the second round, I think you got a good chance of making a viable copy of this knife. It's a good job. Thank you. I made this blade in an hour and a half. I'm just nervous, tense, and expecting the worst. All right, gentlemen, the judges have made the decision. And the bladesmith leaving the forge is Wesley. Fortunately, your blade didn't make the cut, and Doug's going to tell you why. Wesley, I really appreciate all the effort and time that you put in. But at the end of the day, your blade has the least amount of material to make it a viable blade and get it back on track. And for that reason, you send me home. Understood. Well, Wesley, you fought hard through a very difficult competition, but unfortunately, your blade's not going to be moving forward in the next round. For that reason, I'm going to have to ask you to please surrender your work and step off the forge floor. This blade was extremely difficult. This is definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. But I am going to go home and make a serpentine push dagger, and it's going to look just like Jay Nielsen, and I'm going to send him a picture of it. Gentlemen, congratulations. The three of you are moving forward in the second round of this competition. And in this round, Jay's got a stipulation for you. Bladesmiths, remember you have to sharpen both your edges being a dagger, and you have to add handles. And for that, you're going to use one of my favorite handle materials, burl wood. Now, guys, at the end of this round, the judges are going to test for strength and durability in a sheet metal punch and a metal chain slash. Then they're going to check your edge retention in a canvas stab and slice. Placements, we put two hours on the clock for this round of the competition. Good luck. Your time starts now. Well, Dale set himself up in a really good position for this round. He's got the least amount of work to do. I have to work on the tip, so hopefully it'll hold up in a sheet metal punch. Dale's tip is a little bit lean and longer than what yours is. So you leave yourself open for the testing of that tip to snap off. Basically, I just have a knife blank with a very rough shape. So first thing I'm going to do is take my knife up to the example and try and trace out a little bit of a shape. Well, look what John's doing. That's, That's perfect. Smart. He had a billet bigger all around than your example. So now just reduce to the side. Exactly. Tyler's got a lot of grinding to do. Good thing about Tyler's blades, it's got the form that we're really looking for. Yeah. yeah. My to-do list for this round is I have to get all this weight off this knife and then try to get my thick, thick edges into it, some sort of edge. I'm making a push dagger handle, which is T-shaped. The tang is perpendicular to the blade. We have to put some wood scales on there, and it has to be large enough to be comfortable and small enough to fit in the hand. You look at Jay's design, and the handle size isn't that big. That does not mean it's any less complex than any other handle. I got my pins in the handle material. I just got to shape it, make it comfortable, take the hot spots off, and get it ready. Bladesmiths, you are down to one hour. I got the handle roughly ground out. Figure Tom get some pinholes in it. It's drilling great. And then it hits hard spot. Nope. Figured I am not wasting any more time. I'm going to go straight to the cutting torch. Uh, John's got the hat wrench. John is blowing, blowing holes. Blowing He's blowing holes. Yeah. Oh, no. Let's hope he doesn't accidentally overheat that and lock that hang right off. Using that torch, I can overheat my metal and lose my temper and hardness in the tang, but I just don't have time. I got to try it. So I've got one in shot. I got to get this done right. All right, moment of truth. 
Oh, wow. Those are the cleanest holes I've seen with a torch. You know, I got the holes burned through the tank, but I know I still have a lot to do. So now I have to move on. Bushmiss, you have 30 minutes before testing and elimination. Tyler's still taking a ton of material off. I've been at the grinder for a while, and I'm just going to continue until I get it to where I can feel an edge. So once I'm there, I'll go to my handle. Oftentimes, we see the Smiths, their handle's like an afterthought. But their handles oftentimes send them home because they're not refined enough, or they're actually dangerous for you guys to swing. I'm feeling pretty good about this blade, trying to make it as sharp as I can before the end of the round. With all the curves around it, it's important that the athlete get to every edge of that, which is going to be difficult. The inside curves are horrible. I have to use the small wheels and grind them vertically to get in there and get them sharp. Now I need to start getting the handle shaped. It looks like he's got a pretty bulbous egg-shaped handle, which is pretty important for this one, because you have to have a good, solid grip yeah. and a lot of material in your palm. Tyler still doesn't have that handle shaped at all. I still have to make a punch dagger type handle, so it's going to be a pain in the neck to try to get inside those little grooves to grind a perfect little handle for your fingers. Really worrying about Tyler. His handle is tiny. There's so little to grip onto. Five, four, three, two, one. Gentlemen, put down your tools. This round is over. I feel pretty good. I actually have a usable knife in front of me. I wish my tang was a little bit longer, but I think it feels pretty good for my hands. We'll have to see. Bladesmiths, welcome to our strength test, our sheet metal punch and steel chain slash. Remember, it's not what your serpentine daggers do to that steel. I want to see what the steel does to your daggers. And Tyler, you ready to go? I guess so. All right, let's do it. I am concerned a little bit about my handle because it is a little smaller than the other ones, but I'm hoping they can hold on to it. I try to make it nice and thick. All right, Tyler survived. Good job. Your blade is super thick still. I mean, it's it's almost a quarter inch thick. And you did take some chipping on the chain. The handle is a big problem. There's very little to hold on to here. This thing keeps twisting and, and digging and biting into me. It's just really hard to comfortably use this piece. But that being said, you did survive. So good job. Thank you. You ready to go, John? Ready as I'll ever be. All right, well, let's do it then. The chain is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be, and all I can think is, here comes the end. John, you survived. Good job there. Uh, the first few strikes went in real deep. You know, thinner blade, good edge on it. Good job. Thank you. Hey, Dale. How you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling OK. Let's do it. Jay is punching that sheet really hard. I'm worried that my tip's going to break off in that sheet metal. And then I'm worried that the chain's going to destroy my edge. Well, Dale, your edge held up really good, but you had that extension on the tip. And when I did the chain, it just, the tip flew off. But seriously, looking at your grain structure, it's not bad. So it's not from a poor heat treat. 
It was probably just, you know, some slight flaw in there that you couldn't see. It's not a catastrophic failure. We'll just call it a violent reprofiling. I think you're still good. Thank you. All right, bladesmiths, time for the sharpness test. To find out how sharp your weapons are, I'm going to take your weapon and stab and slice on this canvas. Tyler, you're up first. Ready for this? Yes, sir. Let's do this. All right, Tyler, let's talk about your serpentine dagger. First up, the handle. The handle is just too small for a big blade like this. Because of that, with prolonged use, it could hurt the user quite a bit. Now, those stout, you have some sharp edges where you have a clean cut, but there are also areas over here with some dulling that actually just rip rather than cut clean. But overall, sir, your serpentine dagger, you will cut. Thank you, Ted. All right, John, it's your turn, so you ready? Yep. All right, let's do that. All right, John, let's talk about your dagger right here. First stop, this area right here is sharp enough to puncture on this canvas. The edge cuts cleanly. Overall, sir, your weapon, you will cut. Thank you. All right, Dale, your turn, sir. You ready? Yeah, let's poke some stuff. All right, let's poke. All right, Dale, let's talk about your serpentine dagger right here. Your tip, despite getting some damage during the strength test, it was able to puncture. Not easily, we pretty much popped it, but it was able to go through. Your edges are sharp, so you got some nice clean cuts in there. And overall, sir, your weapon, it will cut. Thanks, Doctor. Good job. Well, gentlemen, Jay did not go easy on you in this competition. He gave you a very difficult task, but you all delivered but only two of you are going to be moving forward in this competition. Bladesmith leaving the forge is... Tyler, unfortunately, your blade's not going to be moving forward, and Jay's going to tell you why. Tyler, I got to commend you for working so hard on a very difficult challenge. But at the end of the day, that blade is very heavy, and the handle is very small, and it hurts the user, and I've got the marks to prove it. That's why we're sending you home. Thank you. Well, Tyler, you have a lot to be proud of, but unfortunately, you're not going to be going forward in this competition. This time, I have to ask you to please step off the forge floor. Thank you, guys. It was a lot of fun. It's disappointing that I can't move on to the final round, but I am happy that I was able to get this far. It was fun to actually make this knife that was specifically designed for us by Jay. He made it difficult on purpose. I'm happy that I was able to get as far as I did with that. Blaze Smith, congratulations. You're moving forward in the third and final round of our competition, where we're sending you back to your home forges to build an iconic weapon from history. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance because I didn't choose this blade. That was up to Jay. Blaze Smith, you didn't think I was going to start taking it easy on you now, did you? No. I want you to build this. I'm going to get now, Chris. The Maguindanao Chris traces its origin back to the 14th century Mindanao, the second largest island in the Philippines. This double-edged sword is defined by its distinct waves designed to inflict wide, deadly slashes in combat. The amount of waves in the warrior's weapon also indicates their status within the tribe. The more waves, the higher the rank. The Chris was the most common Moro sword, and many can be seen today in museums across the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Now, gentlemen, when you're building your Magina out Chris's, you need to fall within these parameters. Your blades need to measure between 22 and 24 inches. The base part needs to be flambeiraged with two peaks and two valleys. 
The base of your blade needs to feature a Chris styled flare, and you need to add on a bird's beak shaped handle. Hardest part of making this blade at home is going to be the curves again. I mean, it's it's a whole new thing to me, and so I got to get that figured out and quick. You'll have four days at your home forge to build your blades. Good luck, gentlemen. We'll see you then. <laughs> Good luck. Bye. Day one. So I decided to use Damascus on this. I know my competitor is going to bring a really nice blade, and I want to jazz it up a little bit. Okay. So with this sword, once again, they're throwing curves at us. Curves are not my thing. I haven't done them. But I'm pretty confident I can get this thing done and have it turn out pretty nice, though. I'm making some pretty good time on this. So for day one, I got everything forge welded and drawn out to a rough shape. Everything went pretty well. Here we are back at my home forge. We're ready to get started on this Maginda now, Chris. It's going to be fun. I've never made anything that really resembles uh, the Chris shape, but I'm confident that I can make this blade. I have the skills to get it done. It's just, uh, do I have the time to do it? Steel's moving uh, slow. Press is a little weak. Keeps bending it all over the place, so I have to keep straightening it out. We're getting there. That's starting to look like a Chris. We're just about at the end of the day, and I feel pretty good about where I'm at. Yay. Day two, we're going to start getting the curves into the, the blade itself, then taking a lot of weight off of it. So now I set up some jigs to get these curves bent into the blade. So at any given moment when you're putting these radicals of a bend in it, your steel could rip and have a tear in it. You got to kind of cross your fingers that you're doing it right. That should work. So the blade's come along really nice. It's in pretty good shape where I want it to be. Oh, crap. Got a little bit of a crack here. Having a weak spot in your blade like that could cause a catastrophic failure and the blade could break. I'm hoping I can grind this out and still have enough width left. If that goes all the way through, I'm gonna be starting over. Seriously. If I can't get this crack ground out, then this is junk. Okay. Finally, I get to the bottom of it, and it's still savable, and I don't have to start over. Big sigh of relief. Feeling pretty good. I uh, just want to get this handle on today. We're getting there. Yesterday, we got the quench done. Everything went perfectly. Handle material is pretty close to shape already. I got my holes through, and now I'm trying to put in the pins, and they don't fit. Whenever something doesn't fit, the only logical solution is to use force. Damn it. And surprise, I cracked the handle. So we'll do that again. The only thing I can do now is make a new handle. It's going to be tough to get this blade finished. Day four, things are going along pretty good. Trying to get the blade polished up a little bit, get the handle put onto it, got to get it etched, and finish it up. Looking good. So with my handle, I'm trying something a little bit different. I'm going to use just a clear scale so that you can still see the Damascus underneath it. So it's not as polished as much as I'd like, but I've got to get the edge on it. All right, got it all sharpened up. Let's go out and give her a quick test. I'm feeling great about what I've accomplished. I do believe that's all I can do. It's the last day. We have a lot of work to do. All right. The handle is glued up. The epoxy is set. Doesn't look bad. Now that I'm going to wrap the handle with hemp, it's not a requirement, but it'll give a good grip, and it looks kind of cool. I have a completed weapon. Just to turn in uh, something complete at the end of these rounds is kind of a feat, so I'm super happy that I'm done. Gentlemen, welcome back to the forge. You guys spent four days building your McGinn now, Chris's, and they both look fantastic. But before we get into the testing, I want to hear about them. So, John, how'd it go for you? Oh, it went pretty good. That's 48 layers, uh, 1095 and 15 and 20. I had to go with a little extra, so I went with the clear handle so you could see the Damascus in that as well. That's really neat. Well, Dale, how'd it go for you? It went pretty well. It's a 5160 steel blade with a twist Damascus guard and a black walnut handle with a hemp wrap. Both your Chris's look fantastic. They both look deadly, but there's really only one way for us to find out which one of you is going to leave here, the title of Fortune Fire Champion, and a check for $10,000. We have a strength test, we have a sharpness test, and up first, the kill. Doug. Ladesmiths, welcome to the kill test. 
to find out what kind of lethal damage your weapon will do, I will take your Chris and deliver some lethal blows on this big carcass. John, you're first. You ready for this? You bet. All right, let's do this. The pig carcass is a tough chest. A lot of bone, thick skin, can cause your edge to start chipping on the bones. And I can just tell it's not going to be a cakewalk. Sweet. All right, John, let's talk about your Magidanao Chris here. I really appreciate that you have this large flare because it's a very forward heavy blade. But because of that weight and a very sharp edge you have here, these are very, very deep cuts on this big carcass. It'll keel. <laughs> cool. Dale, your turn, so you ready? That's what I'm here for. All right, let's do this. That is a huge pig up there. It's full of ribs and a long spine, so fine edge on big bones. I'm scared to death. Who knows what's going to happen? All right, Dale, let's talk about your Maguindanao Chris. First up, it's a lot lighter. Now, that allows me to use velocity to cut down a pig like this with the same amount of strikes. The edge will cut deeply, and overall, sir, your weapon, it will kill. Awesome. Bladesmiths, welcome to our strength test. One of my personal favorites, the ice block chop. I'm going to take your Chris swords and try to free those masks. We're going to have some fun. John, you're up first. You ready to go? I am. Go make snow cones. Well, we could do that. Nice work, John. Love the Damascus. Um, very heavy. It tears through the ice, but if the ice blocks was any bigger, it'd be tearing through me, too. And you got a bit of a warp, but still razor sharp. Good job. Thanks. Dale, you ready to go? If anybody's going to break my sword, it might as well be you. Hey, I appreciate that. Let's do it. Dale, nice job. The only complaint I have is your wrap here is loose, but everything's still tight. Your edge is good. Nice job. Nice Shay. All right, bladesmiths. This is the sharpness test, the palm slice. To find out how sharp your weapons are, I'm going to take your Maguindanao Chrysus and try to cut through these palms. John, you're up first. You ready for this? I am. Nice. All right, John, let's talk about your weapon here. First up, your edge is still very sharp. It's just that the weight of this has me holding on to it because I don't want this to be flying around. But for this particular test, it will cut. Thank you. Dale, your turn. Are you ready? Slice it up. All right, will do.
Right there, let's talk about your Maguindanao Chris here. It's thin and razor sharp. Definitely the type of edge you want in cutting these brushes. And overall, sir, your edge, you will cut. Thanks, Doug. Well, Blaze Smith, before we get into the hard part, I want to say it's been a pleasure watching both of you guys work. There's been a lot of twists and turns in Jay's challenge, but this is a competition, and there's only one champion. The Forge and Fire champion today is... Dale, congratulations. John, you did a fantastic job, but unfortunately, your Chris isn't going to end up on the wall, and Jay's going to tell you why. John, you did a great job in all these challenges, but during the strength test, that bend in the blade, and the overall weight of the blade, those are the reasons that we're sending you home. No, I agree. Well, John, unfortunately, your time in this competition has ended. I'm going to have to ask you to please step off the forge floor. All right. It's been a great experience, man. Thank you, John. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, John. This whole journey with Forge and Fire has been incredible. Knowing that no matter what happens, what goes wrong, you keep going, keep pushing, and you can overcome whatever obstacle comes in front of you. Well, Dale, congratulations, man. That means you're the newest Forge of Fire champion. You just won yourself a check for $10,000. Well done. <laughs> I'm, I'm blown away. Super proud. Literally, the day before I started that was five years to the day that I lit my first forge. No kidding. So, who knew five years later you'd be a Forge of Fire champ? Everybody who knows that Jamaican eyes asks, when are you going to be on Forge of Fire? Now I can tell them not only have I been on Forge and Fire, but I won a Jay Nielsen challenge.